All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. This is the Thanks. Douglasville sales meeting on Tuesday, May 19th, 2020. Um, want to welcome everybody. And uh, there is a chat feature or you can unmute yourself for any questions as we go along. And Kim, I am going to hand it over to you. Oh my goodness, I didn't have anything prepared. Well, welcome everyone. So uh, how is everyone doing during this epidemic? I mean, or how are you guys finding that you're doing sales and listings and the ease of doing those? Anybody want to chime in? Laura, you've been doing quite a bit during this time. You want to share how things have been going with you? I'm trying to, can everybody hear me? <clears throat> well, I, I think it was staying pretty busy um, for, the, for a little while, but in the last week I've noticed a little slowdown. And um, I'm a premier agent on Zillow, and I've noticed that some of the leads that I've been getting through that have uh, been like lower listings, like 39,000, 49,000, 59,000, where we were getting better, higher leads, and you know, better qualified leads. Seems like the people that are coming in aren't really qualified. So um, in that respect, it's changing. It seems like it's the it seems like the market's changing a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how are your closings going? Are you doing parking lot closings? I've done parking lot closings. I have I have done where we you know they allowed the agents to go. Um, I try to let my clients know that I'll be there if you know they want me there, and if they allow me to be there, I'll be there. Um, so I've done several, and we've had separate offices for buyers and sellers. So the buyers are in one um, room and the sellers are in another room. Um, so that's how, you know, uh, and some are not allowing you, you know, the, it just really is based on the attorney, I think, and what their rules are. Okay, yeah, because uh, the closing I had, we were definitely in the parking lot and everybody was kind of separate, you know, in each car. So right. uh, it actually ran pretty smoothly. Yeah. You know, so there wasn't any problem with that. Um, I know the sales, considering the epidemic, has stayed pretty steady. Um, I know from a lender perspective, we've seen uh, the guidelines change a little bit in perspective to credit scores and what um, they are using as qualifying now. Um, are you guys having problems with trying to get your people qualified? No? Yes? I, I will say, um, and we'll let Linda address this when she hops on, hopefully she'll hop on, but um, from some of the other lenders I'm hearing, FHA and VA went way up, and Sean might have more knowledge on this too, they went way up in their minimum credit score, but they are now gradually bringing those minimum credit scores back down. Mm -hmm. um, also, just generally speaking, our compliance department is busy. We are seeing, we have seen a lot of TNRs. The TNR, the, the terminations are slowing down and we are seeing increasingly more contracts. Our compliance department is very busy. We're not in the typical spring market, but we are definitely in a busy, um, like winter market. Um, and also just in general, while I'm here and have the floor, um, I want to let you guys know that the forms that we came up with, uh, to help protect you guys and our clients, the showing protocol form and the buyer brokerage addendum, they are optional at this point. Well, they were always optional. Well, we wanted y'all to use them, but ultimately it's still your public's, uh, ultimate decision if they wanted to sign those documents or not at this point. Um, it is up to you and your client if you choose to still keep in place that showing protocol um, or the buyer brokerage addendum um, and open houses are now allowed. We did forbid, uh, prohibit, I guess I should say, you guys from having open houses. You may have open houses now, but please get something in writing from your seller uh, regarding what sort of protocol or requirements uh, they have for that. Additionally, I will let you know that if you are using that showing protocol and having strict guidelines for showing, as soon as the seller breaks it for one client, 
or one potential showing, you cannot use it anymore, or it is a potential, it could be perceived as a potential fair housing violation, you must be consistent. So if a seller, if you do have that showing protocol in place and a seller uh, uses it, you must use it on each and every showing period, end of story, no exceptions. Once that seller chooses to make an exception, you may not, uh, you may no longer use that for any buyer, any showing. Okay. Um, last week, FMLS did a uh, webinar on virtual listing presentation. Did anyone tune into that? Anybody? Uh, I found it very interesting on doing listings from a virtual standpoint um, with a seller. Um, if you missed that, FMLS does have that in their library. So it's basically, you're doing a cloud CMA, it's uh, worked off of cloud CMA, and um, you're, you're, you're going on and you're connecting by Zoom or one of the other virtual um, avenues with your seller and doing your presentation with the seller virtually. Now the disadvantage that I would think in doing this is you're doing a presentation with your seller without seeing their house. So, you know, you're not gonna know what you're gonna have to list until you get in to see the property. So you're not gonna know what kind of property you're listing at that point in time. So that was the only drawback that I saw, but it was interesting to see that now we can do listings from computer to computer with uh, the seller. So uh, I don't know how you guys feel about trying to do that. Um, but if you get a chance, go on to FMLS and log into the library and look for virtual listing presentation with uh, using Cloud CMA. Dana, did you get a chance to kind of inquire into that? I don't think she's tuning in. Did you get a chance to tune in to virtual, uh, the virtual listing presentation using Cloud CMA? No, I did not. Uh, it's interesting. So that was part of what I did last week. And then I also, um, Mike Koskin had a webinar where he was doing REO, um, how to connect with REO companies. And he had a list of different avenues that you could go to to become a listing agent with the REO company. So uh, I think he's predicting that through all this, there are going to be foreclosures and then banks are going to be coming on board to sell these. Now, I don't know this REO market, if it does happen, is going to be different than 2008, 2009, 2010, because then people were upside down in their in their investments. Uh, this time around, people are going to have equity. So I don't know how forgiving those banks are going to be in working with people. So any anybody want to chime in on that? I think, Kim, uh, just to echo what you're saying, I totally yeah. agree. This, this uh, down economy we're in is not an, an organic down economy. N nothing like it was in 2008. Um, and as soon as uh, more states open up and uh, 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 I was going to say something, but it was going to be, uh, I'm going to try and keep my opinion out of it. But um, as soon as <clears throat> people <clears throat> get back to work, like they, sh well, like as soon as people get back to work and things open up, the economy will bounce back quickly. And like I said, this is. I believe there will probably be some short sales and some foreclosures, but it is not going to be anything like it was in 2008 because they're not, like you said, there's equity there. Um, they're not bundling bad loans with good loans um, like they were. And I think actually there might be, I think the mortgage companies might end up being more forgiving and let people catch up. I think short sales might be, more of an issue than actual foreclosures. Um, additionally, while I, is Linda on here yet? Mm -mm. No, I don't see her yet. Um, one of the things that I learned just to share with you guys, and it's not, hopefully it's not really an issue, but if one of your past clients or current clients or potential clients 
does take advantage of the forbearance market where they do a forbearance on their mortgage payment. Number one, as soon as that forbearance is over, they must pay back all the months they didn't pay immediately. It's, it doesn't get tacked on to the end, at least right now. And additionally, if they do that and do pay it back, it is 12 months before they can sell or refinance. Mm, that's interesting. So that's that. what I learned from another lender. So, Okay. Um, that's all that I have as far as the difference between now and last month. Um, I think we're getting toilet paper back. <laughs> uh, I haven't seen the Lysol yet, but... <laughs> Hey, Kim. Yeah. Um, in response to what Dana just said, I am in a private Facebook group with realtors around the country, and a couple of them have said that they called their banks directly and that they have told them they, they will put the payments on at the end of the loan. Mm -hmm. I, know, I know Linda has said with the forbearance and that stuff that it all comes due at the end of your three months or whatever it is that it all comes due. But from what I have heard and seen from some of them they're saying that individual banks may give you the option to put it on at the end just make you know extend the payments out by the three months or whatever i don't I, you know i think that probably varies bank to bank but anyhow it, it would certainly be worth at least a call to check and see about that yeah i agree can y'all hear me yep hi sean haran here i agree with what um was just being said about the matter Jan, you're exactly right. Some individual banks, and there are, um, I believe, one or two in Douglasville that are allowing that to be tacked onto the end of the term. So it is really individual, but most of the larger institutions, the SunTrust Bank of Americas, and right. ones of that nature are all requiring that, like Dana indicated, that it be paid back at the end of the forbearance period. And as Dana did indicate, that is correct information. You must wait one year before you can do anything at that point. Um, so, but check with your individual lender, like Dana indicated or excuse me, like Jan just indicated for your own protection. Yeah. Uh, was anybody dealing with any issues that they'd like to bring to the table and uh, put on the floor? Miss everybody. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'll be glad when we can get back uh, into the social environment. I'm yes. glad everybody too. Um, Kevin, everybody. do you have anything that you want to um, Bring on the floor because I think I've uh, exhausted everything that I have. Uh, no, no, I don't. Um, just uh, trying to figure out how to get keep things moving in this different environment. Um, kind of been leery about some showings and stuff like that, but now I'm, I'm at a point now where I'm kind of back to it. So just trying to pick things up a little bit. Okay, um, Sean, you want to take over from here and uh, let us see what uh, you're dealing with and what you. Uh, on your plate. Sure. Good afternoon. Good morning, all. I'm happy to be here with you all today and have a few things I wanted to discuss with you. As I believe you all know at this point, I have officially merged with Don DeFore office and we are partnered up. And it has been officially six months. We were giving a six month trial on both ends. That has worked out um, wonderfully well, in my opinion. I'm very content with the staff we have here. Megan on the pre-closing side, Susan on the closing side, Christy on the post-closing side are very on top of the files. And we've had great um, feedback from agents at Maximum One and other offices regarding the increased level of service we're able to provide. I also, and I don't believe it's just because of the pandemic and being stranded at home, because if that were the case, I'd be, you know, uh, spending a lot of time with my kids, but I have a lot more time available if you guys have questions, issues, and um, direct assistance needed. You can Zoom with me, email me, or call me on the phone and we can talk. Um, closing procedures in our office have kind of been evolving as we go back. We have been utilizing up until this point primarily parking lot closings. And that has been working out quite well, except for the days when it rains or when we had 90 degree days, like we did last week, a couple of days in the upper 80s. Um, with that all being said, we are in the process of transitioning probably June 1st we'll do that, which will be week after next, to more of an in-office setting again. We're able to, as of right now, we'll be keeping the office pretty much closed only to the office or only to the staff being in there so we can keep a sterile environment for their safety and yours. And we've been doing the closings out in the parking lot where we stagger the parties out 
and that has been working quite well. Just to clarify the firm position, we welcome any and all agents provided you keep your social distance. So as long as you're able to keep your distance out in the parking lot or keep your distance in the office, we do not have any objection to agents coming to closing and attending closing. I've even had agents, you know, where I set the table up out in the parking lot next to their car, they wind the window down, they sit comfortably in their car and their air conditioning and are able to listen to the entire closing five, six feet away. So we have come up with scenarios to make it work for all parties, but making you all aware, there are additional options available to your clients if they wish to have a video closing, we are able to do that. We have not done very many of them. I've, I can count on one hand the number I've done. And primarily it's because a lot of folks don't have the technology um, to be able to set up for a video closing, especially out in the West Georgia area where you've got issues with involving internet connectivity uh, as well as reception and other matters going on. So we've been primarily focusing on doing the parking lot closings or mail outs if it you know, is applicable or uh, appropriate to do so. One thing, if you want to do a video closing, you must remember we can only do video closings if all parties are in the state of Georgia. If I've got a buyer in California, I cannot do a video closing and remotely notarize his documents. So we must have that in order to accomplish remote um, closing. If you wish to have a remote closing or video closing that way, please just let me know and I'll be happy to accommodate and get that set up for you all. We can set up a Zoom conference and get that accomplished with you being on the uh, video, of course, with the closing occurring. Also, we are available or we're making available um, closing starting June 1 in our office, like I indicated. We will be keeping one party, buyer or seller, out in our lobby area while the other party comes in for closing and then we'll trade places. Please encourage your clients to wear face masks, gloves, and any other protection that they can find or that they feel appropriate to keep everybody safe. Um, one thing I wanted to mention regarding the um, disbursements, we are happy to disperse your funds for your clients' funds if appropriate whether it be buyer refund, seller proceeds, or agent commission checks, we can, re we can disperse those via wire or via check. And it's really whatever you prefer. If they go via wire, we incur a fee, and right now we're absorbing that fee. So there's no charge or additional cost to you if you wanna have your funds wired from closing. We're offering that more as a public service to make it safe for everybody. So we're incurring the cost there if we have to wire funds. Um, Don, just to interrupt you one second, um, agents, if you guys are getting your commission wired, what Sean is talking about is if you get an approved DA, he is wiring it directly to your account. We do not accept wired commissions. Right. We'll accept wire oh. earnest money, but we do not accept wired commissions. So Sean's talking about thank, directly thank, yeah, thank to you. your account thank with you an clarifying. approved DA. Yes, thank you for clarifying that. I'm, I'm referring to your own commissions when we have a DA in effect, of course, the maximum one we can mail the check to the office as well as the settlement statement or if you prefer taking it with you, we can make it available once we disperse the closing. Um, but good point, Dana, thank you. We only are wiring um, funds to agents and we're not charging a fee to wire funds to your uh, account if you need to have that. Um, as far as the upcoming days ahead, as we go into you know, hopefully the waning of this pandemic around Georgia and the country, um, we're gonna, start opening up more and more as we're able to safely do so. But for right now, we are continuing to do parking lot closings. The one thing with parking lot closings, as I indicated, is if it gets hot or if it's rainy out, we have to go into the lobby downstairs and it's not as open of an air environment. So again, encourage your clients to be wearing protective masks and gloves if possible. As I indicated last month at the meeting, we are providing pens that they get to keep as souvenirs. Nothing terribly fancy, but nonetheless, that way we don't have contamination with pens and we are wiping down um, closing tables and chairs prior to you know closings that occur back to back or you know when we have uh, subsequent closings in the day. One thing I want to mention today is we are finding a nice increase in business and Dana from your perspective you said it's more of a busy winter than it is um, solid spring over at our office, we're actually experiencing a solid spring right now. We're, we're actually getting a really good volume and a lot of that volume is coming from Maximum One Agents. So again, thank you for the support, your loyalty and your love. Um, we want to be there any way we can for you to help out with making sure we get through this pandemic and navigate through the issues that develop as we go forward. The staff 
in my office are often working remotely. We tend to have at least two staff members in the office at all times, but there may be one or two members working remotely. So if you reach out to us and uh, via email, please be patient if we happen to have a staff member who is um, remotely working or maybe en route between offices or between the office and the home office. Also, please remember that when you're sending information in, I realize we're in different times now and you're not able to necessarily get with your client directly. So a lot of things are being done um, either via the internet for yourselves or via video. Please make sure if you have an amendment drafted or if you have an amendment executed that you forward that amendment to us. We've noticed that with the pandemic, there's been not as much communication and forwarding us documents that we may need for closing, um, including buyer and information seller sheet, buyer and information sheets for the buyer and the seller. We must have that information to be able to process the file and to get things going um, for your benefit and for your client's benefit. So please, when we send over the buyer and seller information sheets, please remind your clients to send those back to us and get them back to us as quickly as possible so we can keep closing on track on our side. Um, the other item I wanted to mention about is, well, before I go there, I'll talk about documents needed for closing. And I wanna bring this up because it's come up repeatedly and I talk about it every so often, but we probably have new agents or additional agents on this meeting that may not have heard this before, as well as um, some agents that may not remember this. In particular, when you're dealing with a corporate buyer or seller or an estate involving the purchase and sale of the property, there are additional documents that are required for us to be able to ensure title and make sure we can get to closing. On the corporate side, we can look up the company on the Georgia Secretary of State's website. We can verify that the company is in existence and active and compliance. If it's not, we can reach out to you and tell you that. That's not so important to have the articles of incorporation or articles of organization for an LLC. What is important that we have is some type of bylaws or operating agreement that dictate how the, or who is authorized to sell real property, verifying that the company is authorized to purchase or sell property and other you know, matters related to that. If we do not have a document that shows the authority of an individual or more than one individual to convey property, then we may have to draw up a resolution saying, you know, be it resolved that Joe, Mary, and Pete are all authorized to sign on behalf of the company and that we had that resolution signed by all the officers or all the members of the company um, as applicable. Also, when you have a corporate um, purchaser or corporate sale, if it's a corporation, we either need to have two signatories who are officers or we need a corporate seal. So please remind your um, clients that have corporations that they must bring their corporate seal to closing to um, seal the documents that they are signing. When we are dealing with the probate side of the equation, in probate, there are all types of scenarios that can pop up. And again, if you have questions or concerns, reach out to my staff, reach out to me directly. I'll be happy to guide you on any particular set of circumstances as to what you may need or what you may need to bring to closing. But when you have a probate situation going on, typically two options, the person died with a will or the person died without a will. If they died with a will, we need to see a copy of the will. If they died without a will, then there may not be any document to provide there, but in order to convey the property, some type of administration must have taken place on the estate, whether it be a petition for letters of administration, a petition for a year's support, or other type of probate um, avenue available to the decedent's family or um, next of kin. When we're requesting these documents, the quicker you can get them to us, the quicker we can get them approved by our title company and get to closing, because there may be a situation where you think you have all the documents you need for closing, but don't realize that, oh wait, we administer the estate and we have letters of administration, but those letters of administration do not provide the authority for the administrator to convey property without a specific court order. So we have to go back in to get a court order to quote unquote, leave to sell the property. That's just one example of why it's so important that we be able to look at these probate documents and that your clients provide those to us so that we can help guide them to closing as quickly and efficiently as possible. Um, when you have a probate of an estate that had a will or the person died, what we call a testate, we need to see the letters testamentary that were issued to the executor. If they died without a will 
or intestate, we need to see a copy of the letters of administration or other documents that would provide for authority for the individual to sell the property. So these are just reminders of documents that we need you guys to make sure your clients are providing to us timely at closing. The quicker we get these, the better we can get to closing. Thankfully, it was not a maximum one agent, but I got torn apart about two weeks ago by an agent that was just disgruntled because we did not have the documents ready for closing on the probate side, even though we requested them five separate times and we could not get to closing because they thought that documentation through a death certificate that the person had died should be sufficient evidence for the family to convey the property. Unfortunately, the law in Georgia does not work that way. So we have to have certain instruments and as we guide you as to what we need, please make sure your clients are aware that they have to get those items to us in order to get to closing and the quicker they get them to us, the better we'll all be. The last thing I wanted to remind you all is to try to keep a positive. Sean, Sean yes. before you move on, um, a couple issues with uh, people dying. Okay. Uh, that didn't sound right, but <laughs> okay. um, <clears throat> number one, we've had a lot of questions. Um, well, if you'll comment too about the way uh, a couple, for example, has title to a property and sure. that issue with um, right of survivorship versus tenancy in common. And the Definitely. second issue is, uh, we've had issues where we've had agents that have a listing and the person dies um, and a question of the timing, who can sign the contracts. Uh, if you'll just address that a little bit, that would be wonderful. Absolutely. To address the first point regarding holding title, if the individuals hold title as um, John Smith and Mary Smith, and that is it. It does not make any reference to as joint tenants with right of survivorship and not as tenants in common or any language like that. If that magical language is not on the deed, then the likelihood is that they, is that they hold title together as tenants in common. Upon the death of either party, that title does not automatically transfer to the other party. And a joint tenancy with survivorship deed, that interest would automatically transfer. But if they do not have that magic language of joint tenancy with survivorship, the interest will not automatically transfer, but rather will go into that individual's estate. In order to convey that interest out, the estate must be, or must go through some form of probate, whether it be an administration or um, probate of a will. So don't automatically assume because two individuals are entitled together and one dies, that the other one has title to the property alone. We have to verify the type of deed that is out there. Um, also, with respect to joint tenants with survivorship, just because parties have title as joint tenants with survivorship does not mean that they're clear to go to closing and we don't need anything further. We have to document that the death of the other individual occurred so that the surviving co-tenant co can alone sign at closing. The normal way to do that is by way of an affidavit. And the affidavit can be signed by the closing attorney or by the um, surviving co-tenant stating that you know, they were entitled together as joint tenants with right of survivorship that party A passed away on this date. A copy of the death certificate is attached as, exhibit, as an exhibit and will always mark through the social security number and all and other personal information that may be on the death certificate before recording that. And then we state that fee simple title is now vested in the survivor. So that is a typical requirement to show on the record books notice to the world of the death of the joint tenant. So again, these two types of differentiations, joint tenancy versus tenants in common are important. And if you've got tenants in common, you must do some type of probate. If you have joint tenants with survivorship, you must do some type of an affidavit. And we can take care of the affidavit at our office at closing if we need to, or if you know, it works most efficiently for the parties. But if it's a tenants in common scenario, we can't take care of the probate at the closing table. That has to be coordinated and accomplished prior to us going to closing. So just keep that in mind on that one. Um, Great question, Dana. When I'm going back to the question on the Zoom group chat, um, when you add my name to the closing attorney, please reference my name, Sean Haran, dash Dawn DeFore PC. In the weeks ahead as the partnership develops, we're going to come up with a formal firm name, but right now we're just keeping under Dawn DeFore PC. And again, we have made it official as far as the partnership goes. And it's a um, wonderful opportunity for my firm to be able to get the additional support to provide you know better support to the agents as well as to have additional support from co-counsel other attorneys in the office if i'm not available 
Paul Ellison or Don DeFore are both practicing attorneys in the firm that can assist. But use my name, Sean Haran, dash Don DeFore PC. What that will do, unless you don't want it to do this, but it will guarantee that you get me as your closing attorney unless I'm out of town or sick. And then secondly, it will also make sure that the lender, when they get that contract, sees the name of the firm and um, crosses it correctly so we don't have to change the um, firm name over during the process of getting the loan approved. From my, from my perspective, we have not had any delays. You can still reach me at the same phone numbers, the same emails. If you see my email coming over to you with different phone number or different email address, those work too. So nothing has changed as far as communicating or contacting with, you know, connecting with me. Um, the office number for the firm will reach anybody in the office if you call my number or the new office number for Dawn to four. And of course, if you need me at any time, you can always call my cell number. And I have not been giving that out previously, but during this time, I have been giving it out. If anybody wants to write it down right now, just so you have it handy, it is 404-697-4199. I did meet with Michelle and Anzola yesterday, and we had a great lunch conversation about um, sending out some more official notices, as I've been indicating to you for months now. We were waiting to get the final formalities in place at the firm to make sure we had everything in line before we sent out formal announcements. But we're getting to that time where I believe it's appropriate for us to do so. We have come through that six month period where we both tried each other out and we're ready to partner up. So that will be happening in the days ahead. I do realize that we're limited with social distancing requirements right now, but I'm really hoping to have what I refer to as a social distancing social. Um, and I'm gonna try to figure out how we can make that work, maybe way, way of an ice cream social or other thing. The, Pickup I'm trying to overcome right now is how do we keep a large group of no more than 10 people? So would we that, might have to would, try to come up. Would that make it an anti social social? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, double social doesn't make it anti. Okay. Uh, not in this scenario. Uh, two positives, don't make negative in my book. Never. So, um, but it's going to be a socially distance uh, social. And I'm looking to do that probably mid June. And I will get an announcement out with uh, Michelle as I make the formal announcement of my you know, new digs and how we're running things over there, as well as contact information for myself and my staff. But with that being said, um, hoping to be able to utilize maybe the maximum one parking lot and the maximum one office and keep socially distanced tactics in place in both places so we can keep maybe no more than 10 people in a conference room, maybe no more than 10 people in the lobby area, and no more than 10 people in one area of the parking lot. We can just all kind of migrate around um, socializing and get ourselves back together at least for a, you know um, afternoon of socialization and uh, and if we coordinate our cards right we can probably even plan this for after five o'clock and make it some um, with an adult um, socialization aspect to it if the brokerage is agreeable to that um, but those details will be coming out in the days ahead the other thing I wanted to comment on um, Dana's comment if you have six couples that want to buy some commercial property together, but they don't know how to deed it or how to list them all on the loan. Um, when you're saying that you have six couples that want to buy commercial property and if they want to buy it all together, then they're all going to be basically buying a one sixth interest. Each couple will be purchasing a one sixth interest and they should all be shown on the contract as the purchasers. So you'll need to reference them all on the contract as the purchaser. But with that being said, when you add their name on the contract as the purchaser, you need to make sure the lender's aware that they're each buying a one six interest to make sure that the lender's gonna approve it being done that way. A better option may be for the six couples to form a corporation or entity of some sort and purchase the uh, property under the corporate entity name with them having their respective interests referenced in the um, operating agreement and bylaws of the company. This will also provide an additional level of protection for them as they go through. The, the concern there is you need to make sure the lender is going to be agreeable to allowing the corporation to borrow money, especially if it's a newly formed corporation. So you may have an issue come up there. But Fran, to answer that question, um, and I'm sorry, I thought these were Dana's questions. They appear to be Fran's questions. But to answer that question, you'll want to talk to the lender directly and find out each individual lender is going to have their own requirements as to how they'll want them listed on the loan. 
but most likely they'll want them all to be on there if they're encumbering that property. Most lenders are not gonna allow you know, three couples to encumber a portion of the property and the other three couples to not have a loan on the property. If the property is being encumbered, they're gonna want all title holders to be on that loan. Moving to Dana's second question that she asked a minute ago with respect to signing contracts and other documents when you have a dead person on title, not to be blunt about it, but when you have somebody that passed away and property is listed or if a property is not listed and they pass away, until an individual has been appointed as the representative of the estate, whether it be the administrator, the executor, executrix, or other capacity authorizing the individual to sign on behalf of the deceased, legally speaking, your clients can't really do anything legally. Now, while they can't technically sign the contract legally, I have guided agents numerous times in this matter, and I have suggested that what they reference is um, the person who is next of kin. For example, if it's husband and wife and wife passed away without joint tenancy, um, then husband can sign for himself and then sign um, himself um, named executor in the will of the wife's name um, pursuant to a petition being filed, you know, presently in the probate court of Blank County. So you'll want to have that reference if you do have somebody that's not been appointed by the probate court as a representative of the estate you want to have that individual sign the contract or other document to reference that they are not signing it in the legal capacity as the administrator or executor or other representative capacity. They are signing it just as an individual for that person and stating that they are in the process of petitioning the court to obtain that. Does the contract become binding upon that, execute, upon that signature? That remains a question to be determined in the courts if it comes up. I have not seen that question addressed in the courts, but I'm not saying it hasn't been there. But my position is, is if you show good faith that you're trying to get a property listed or sold, um, if you want to sign a contract and you have an individual that's you know, deceased on title, then you can reference it as the named you know, um, executor or the individual petitioning the court for you know, the administration of the estate if there wasn't a will. Does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. Or are there questions about that, I should say? Now, that example works for signing a contract, maybe an amendment or things of that nature. That example will never work to get you to closing. So at closing, we will have to have the appointed individual on behalf of the estate. Dana, does that answer more or less the question that you had there? Yes, thank so, you. No problem, no problem. Um, if there are any questions from any of the agents, I'm happy to answer them either now or when we get through with the meeting, feel free to reach out to me on my phone or via email. But that being said, I'm very excited about what the spring and summer have to offer. I just think it's going to, I actually had a very gloom outlook about two months ago when it started hitting us. And with the business and the volume and the way people have been able to creatively navigate around the issues. I've been very impressed with how we've been able to accomplish business and during this pandemic. So kudos to all of you for keeping your heads high and moving forward during the difficult times. And like Dana indicated, we will get through this. Thank you. Uh, Brent, do you have anything that you want to bring to the table? I see that you are on with us. Brent? I guess not. Uh, Sean, you were talking about um, the administrator type um, on a sale. Now, once they set up on the contract, but they can't get to closing, um, am I right in still assuming that there is six months in there for that estate to be probated before anything can happen? No. Are you saying it takes a minimum of six months? Is that what you're indicating? Is that what you're questioning? Yeah. Uh -huh. No, I, I've, I've handled administrations um, in less than 30 days. It really depends on what requirements are out there. Some administrations or no administration necessary, for example, which is a type of an administration, believe it or not, um, can be accomplished in a week or two. There are other types that require that notice be published to unknown heirs and other steps be taken, and they could take six months or longer, depending on the time it takes to find the heirs. So there's no set magical number as to time frame involved with the probate of a testate estate or an intestate estate if there wasn't a will. So an administration could happen as quickly as 30 or 60 days, 
or it could take several months to accomplish. It really depends on the facts of each particular state, how many heirs are involved, the willingness of the heirs to sign off on the petition, if, if they are even known where they are, and other factors of that nature. Okay. Um, that's basically all that I have. Dana, do you have anything else? Um, just a couple of things um, regarding the CE classes. Uh, the CE classes for June are still going to be handled virtually, um, but it looks like some of the other branch specific meetings are going to be handled within the branch again to uh, stay in compliance with the guidelines um, and just for the comfort level of our agents. Um, I just want to thank Heidi, Kelly, and Michelle for just going above and beyond for the past several months um, in making sure that we have uh, as little interruption to business and agent service to you guys as possible, dealing with everything we've been dealing with. Um, Heidi's put additional miles on her car by running back and forth, back and forth, uh, picking up deposits and taking care of everything. Um, and we are uh, just, I just want to publicly thank Heidi and Michelle for uh, servicing everything. And also you guys, um, with these virtual CE classes, um, they're great to teach, but the, the reports are crazy, crazy, crazy. There are four reports that we have to amalgamate together to come up with a true CE roster for Greg. And I just want to publicly thank Heidi for the time that it takes to do those is just incredible. Um, and uh, along with making sure that everything is managed uh, for everything else going on, that has just been a huge additional workload. And it's just been, there's a lot of behind the scenes work. But the other good thing is with these virtual CE classes, you guys, we are getting such great exposure to so many agents. We've had uh, one class we had 420 agents on, another class we had 416. The average number of students on these virtual classes is over 200. Um, so it's been really great uh, exposure for what we have going on at Maximum One. So from a, a company perspective, that's a nice thing. From an agent perspective, you guys, it, it, it's so much nicer doing a deal with another agent who has taken our training, because most of these have been on contracts classes. And um, so it, it's just nice knowing that they're hearing our instruction on contracts, and hopefully you guys too. Um, so it's just, it's just been a really interesting, positive uh, uh, outcome from the madness that's going on in the world right now. Okay. Um, there is some discussion right now about the possibility of doing an in-branch meeting for June. So that's going to be something that um, we as team leaders are going to be discussing with Dana and Heidi um, to see how that will play out and probably at some point send out an email to everyone to get their opinion on how they feel about doing an in-branch meeting for June. So kind of be on um, the lookout for that. So uh, we appreciate all of you sticking in there with us. Heidi, thank you so much for everything that you have done for us. Uh, you continue to go above and beyond. So we appreciate you so, so much. Um, if there's anything that we can help with, we being the team leaders, you know, we're there for you. I think the question is going to be once we start coming out of this, how do we get back to work and really become productive? Um, so we're going to be open. We, the team leaders, are going to be open to your input for that. So, uh, you know, we want to be there for you guys and help you be successful as much as possible. So we need your input. So please feel free to reach out to us. And that's all I have. I will say one more thing too, you guys, there is um, so much help and support on the support email, um, as well as rock stars. I've learned a ton of information from the rock stars questions and answers um, because the rock stars, it's every agent from all of our franchises that are on rock stars. 
and there is a ton of great information that's shared because we have a lot of agents that are very well versed and experienced in aspects of real estate um, that I don't have knowledge of because I it's never come up in our franchise and I never dealt with it when I was actually selling so like some land we've got an issue right now where Fran this kind of goes to your question We've got an agent that is selling a property. It was a huge property and it's gotten subdivided, subdivided, subdivided within the family, but they subdivided it by pulling up a picture of the plat and taking a Sharpie and marking it. None of those, <laughs> none of the okay. divisions of lots ever got recorded. So it's kind of turned into a nightmare and um, just the issues that have been discovered and addressed. It just, so you guys, there are fabulous resources out there for y'all. Um, and, uh, just please take advantage of them. Sometimes it's good to look on rock stars just to kind of, uh, track the conversation and see what's going on. And there also is a search button on rock stars. So if you have a question, you might want to go to that search button and look up, for example, VA loans before you ask your question to see what other previous discussions, uh, and answers and issues have been addressed on there. But um, that and Sean, uh, thank you so much. Sean is always available to answer questions. Sean has helped me a lot with some of the uh, COVID-19 issues and uh, uh, the addendum and the showing protocol. And, you know, moving forward, it's just a question. There are a lot of differences of opinions, uh, whether they are personally motivated or politically motivated. Again, I encourage everyone to be kind, to be cognizant of the differences of opinions. Uh, you are not going to change anyone's mind and they are not going to change yours. So there's no sense uh, alienating a potential client, a potential co-op agent, a potential uh, anybody, any professional involved in that situation. Um, just be respectful that there are uh, differences of opinions and beliefs about what is going on in the crazy world right now. Um, but try to separate your professional life and business from your personal uh, opinions and beliefs uh, regarding everything and that that's in general <laughs> anything that that is uh, even above and beyond COVID-19. Dana thank you again um, and just to make sure you all are aware if you have specific needs or questions that come up or need special accommodations whether it be a video closing um, your clients not comfortable signing outside whatever it might be please reach out to me phone call email or otherwise I will be happy to creatively come up with a solution that will work as I even spoke to Michelle about yesterday, if we need to go so far as to close it in the Maximum One conference room, we can always even reserve space in the conference room over at Maximum One Realty in Douglasville, and I do not mind traveling there. It can be a little bit more um, time consuming if we have changes at the closing table, as lenders sometimes like to effectuate, but having said that, I'm more than happy to accommodate any way I can. I thankfully have what I feel to be great support staff that enable me to be able to focus more on what I want to, which is taking care of my agents. So please reach out to me um, if you've not had the opportunity to close with me this year or since I've merged over, please give us a try out and see how the experience is. And if there is good, I want to hear about it. If there is negative, I want to hear about that as well so we can make sure we improve it. Thank you all again. Thank you so much, Sean. You're awesome. We appreciate you so much. Dana, thank you for all that you do for us. We appreciate you and Dave and all the Maximum One staff as well. So thank you for being there for us. And thank you, my am I muted? No. Thank you, uh, Kim and Brent and Kevin, for uh, uh, doing these meetings, even through these unconventional times. They they've been great and very informative. And we will just move onward and upward. And just thank you guys also for your uh, ongoing leadership and support of the office and of the agents, uh, not only in Douglasville but but throughout the whole company. Okay. Well, everyone, have a terrific rest of the month and call us if you need us. And, uh, you know, we'll do everything we can to answer your questions. If we don't have an answer, we'll find someone who does. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Take care, Bye. all. Bye. Thank you. Bye. See you, everybody, later. <laughs> <laughs>